So as we get started today, we've been traveling through a series called Encore. We've been traveling through a series uh, called Encore. Pastor Jonathan has given uh, just one message on a uh, sermon series that he's done in the past, and those have been awesome. If you haven't listened to those, make sure you listen to them uh, this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, whenever. Catch up on those, because those have been good. And so I want to start off, and I want to ask you, have you ever eaten something that you know is bad for you? Not just, I'm not just saying like, like I'm not just saying, um, you know, one day I ate a little bit of junk food. I'm talking about you made a conscious decision. Okay, I'm talking to my lactose intolerant people this morning, okay? I'm talking to those people that you made a conscious decision that the rest of your day you'd be cracking some wind. You made the conscious decision. You knew what you were going into. You knew what you... I'm talking to the people that can't do spicy stuff. I'm talking to Brett when, you know, stupidly... He was talked into doing this like pocky chip or whatever it's called, right? Shows he knew what was coming. He knew lava was coming. It was only a matter of time. I, th I find it funny. My mom, she, uh, she went and some of the ladies went out uh, for Ethiopian, Ethiopian food. And my mom cannot do like after pepper, everything spicy to my mom. Like literally, there's nothing that she's like, I'm like, mom. It's just above pepper. She's like, whoo, like she's sucking the air. I'm like, mom. So she, uh, she told me she ate these, uh, just a little bit of jalapenos. Okay, guys, just a little bit. And she's, I said, mom, how'd you like the Ethiopian food? And she said, Justin, I'm gonna tell you the truth. When I got home, <laughs> Ethiopia and America were having a war inside my stomach and I was just praying that America would win. <laughs> but I remember one time, when I was younger, I, uh, I, after youth group, because this is the cool thing to do, after every youth group, we would go to this place that serves fake food. Now, I'm not going to say the title of this place uh, or the name of this place because some of you, this is your jam. Okay, I'm going to tell you, Applebee's, it's Applebee's, okay? <laughs> so I knew going to Applebee's I knew what was going to happen week in and week out. And I made conscious decisions. I was like, all right. Because some weeks, you know, I was like, I'm cool. My body was ready for it. I'm like, I'm good with it. But some weeks, and I remember one week, I, um, I ate and I was, I was just, I just ate bad. And so I was eating the whole appetizer sampler. I wish I could say I shared that with the table. That was just for me, okay? So I modified it to see what I wanted and so I'd get this appetizer sampler. And I remember we would stay until Applebee's would kick us out. And so I was leaving the restaurant. So there was no turning back. And I remember just Hurricane Katrina hitting my stomach. And there's no way back, right? So I'm, I, I know I'm 10 to 15 minutes away. So I'm traveling home. And guys, I'm telling you the truth. I'm leaning on one side of, you know what I'm saying? I'm leaning, I'm doing birthing breaths. I'm, I'm trying everything I can to make myself just be cool. And I knew, but the thing is, my stupid self, I knew what I signed up for. I knew what I was getting myself into. And so today I want to preach a message from the series, Diet and Exercise. <laughs> Diet and Exercise. And I've entitled this message, Feasting on Foolishness. Feasting on Foolishness. I told Jonathan, um, you know, I thought I was going to preach this message in another series because I was like, man, I was on vacation and I was like, man, this is so good. It hit my heart. And I, and I thought maybe a couple months down the way, uh, but me and Jonathan were talking while I'm on vacation. I'm like, man, whatever you need, I got you. And the first thing he hits me with is, can you preach this Sunday? And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you said, what? Like this Sunday coming up? And so uh, I thought this was going to be later on in the, in the year, but today we're talking feasting 
on foolishness. And there's a passage in the Bible, don't bring it up just yet, but there's a passage in the Bible while I was on vacation, I was reading, and it's found in Luke 11, 33 through 36. But before I get there this morning, I want to give you some context. I want to tell you what's going on because I, th I think the way Luke 11 sets all of this up for what we're going to talk about today is a perfect setup. So Luke 11 starts off and it kind of flows like this. It starts out with Jesus teaching us how to pray. If you were at um, prayer night on Monday or you tuned in on Facebook, uh, we went through that model. He taught us how to pray. Our father who art in heaven, he goes through all of this thing. And then the very next part is Jesus gives a parable about persistence in prayer. He talks about the neighbor wanting to borrow some bread. And even the annoyed neighbor that said his uh, family, they're already in bed, go away. And, and he talks about how if, if, when you keep asking, when you're persistent in prayer, when you knock, when you, when you keep on knocking, it will be given to you. And then Jesus shows us what kind of prayer, what, what prayer does for us. He then goes on and he casts out a demon. He casts out a demon in, in front of all of them, but really these people, they aren't impressed. They wanted Jesus to keep proving himself. They wanted, to be, they wanted Jesus to be this magical show pony that continuously gave them signs and wonders and miracles and stuff. And then Jesus says, repent. He tells him, he says, repent. He said, you ain't getting another sign. He goes on to talk about uh, the sign of uh, Jonah and Nineveh, Nineveh, where he was stuck in the uh, belly of a big fish. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to be the sign. I'm the sign for you people. And he tells us he's even greater than Solomon and all of his wisdom. He's greater than Jonah. And he calls these people foolish. Because even the people in Nineveh repented. And then he talks about a, a queen uh, named Sheba that he, he, he says he's even greater than Solomon. King Solomon, Queen Sheba was back in 2 Kings and she's questioning to see if Solomon's legit. So she goes and meets him out and she's like, gets him, hits him with all these tough questions and Solomon just keeps hitting. And she believed right then and there. He was who he says he is. He said, I'm greater than even all of that. So Jesus lays this foundation with the people about prayer and how sick he is of giving signs and still unbelief. And then the chapter breaks down and leads us to where we're going to go today. And it's found in Luke eleven thirty three, And it says this, no one lights a lamp and then hides it or puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where its lights can be seen by all who enter the house. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your whole body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when it's unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. Here's what I find interesting. I find interesting the gospels talk about light so much. They talk about light. Jesus says this earlier on in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. He's talking about externals. He goes on to say, don't put your light on under a bowl. And then he says, let your light shine before men. He's talking about all externals, how we live, how we show people that we are his. It's talking about external, but I find it crazy in Luke 11 and later on in the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew even talks about this, what we're reading today. He says, he turns it internal. He makes it internal. What I see, what I allow inside my heart illuminates my heart 
and life, or it creates dark spots in my life. He switches it from saying, you are the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. You are this, you're this. But then he says, your eye is the window to your heart. Your eye, if it's unhealthy, it's the window to your heart. And Jesus and the Bible oftentimes uses light in our spiritual walk because it perfectly illustrates surrender. When a light is on, here's what I've never seen a light on. I've never seen somebody like, oh my gosh, I can't find the door. I've never seen, now some of y'all are just blind, like Pastor Billy, if he took off his glasses. But those of you that walk in the light, I've never seen somebody like, boom, ow, how did I do that? Because light exposes. Why? Because light reveals, darkness conceals. Light reveals, darkness conceals. So Jesus said in the Gospels, It's important that you set yourself apart. You are the light of the world. You are the light for everybody else. But how can you be light if you don't live in light yourself? If your eye isn't healthy, the gospel would say there are parts of your heart that are in darkness. Now, usually this part of the sermon we start uh, thinking about, the pastor would start talking about major sins. He would talk about sexual immorality and lust and how you need to get that out of your house and how you need to get that out of your heart. But today, I think in the church, we miss talking about the small things. We miss talking about the little things. And I would suggest when Jesus was given the Sermon on the Mount, He exaggerated things like anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed sin, has committed sin in their heart. He talks about even when you have hate towards your brother, you're going to receive judgment. It's as if you murder. He exaggerates all these points. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Why does he make these very exaggerated things? I would suggest that if we handle, Jesus is saying, if we handle the small things, we don't get to the major things. We don't go down that path. If we deal with the small things first, we don't get to that. So I want to give you three things to watch out for. Three things in your spiritual diet to watch out for. Number one, I want you to watch out for the Sam's Club samples. Watch out for the Sam's Club samples. You know, anybody, when we go to Sam's Club or Costco, it doesn't matter who we are. You walk around that mug, even if you ain't all that interested, and you're like, I mean, new nutrition stuff, I'll try it, whatever. And how many of you intentionally or unintentionally, you were supposed to have lunch or dinner, but you filled up on the Costco and Sam's Club samples. And just like that, in our, in our walk with God, I want to talk to you about the Sam's Club samples in our life. The small things. I found it interesting. There's a passage in the Bible, or not a passage, but a scripture that talks about this so good. And it's found in Song of Songs 2, 15. And it says this. It says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin our vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Let me explain. The book is a poetic picture of of love and marriage and it's composed by uh, King Solomon and, and she, his fiance is writing this towards their upcoming marriage. She says she knows that there's little things that can come up and spoil their marriage. And I want to suggest in the same way, allegorically speaking, there are small foxes that can ruin our vineyards that are in bloom. There are small foxes that can ruin our vineyard that are in bloom. I, I read an article 
And this guy, he's, he's weird. He studied foxes. This is only stuff that my friend Chad Michael would do. This is who I think of. But this guy, Dr. Andrew Carter, he set up this, like he built this little shed or tent or whatever to live outside, to follow and look at foxes to watch how they run, how they do things, how like the, the, the things that they feast on and the things, just their way of life. And he said, nearly every night, these foxes would travel anywhere from six to 15 miles away, right after dusk. The moment it got dark and none of the harvesters were out, they would spend hours eating grapes. And then they'd take a nap. So they'd spend hours, they'd go out right when the harvesters left. They would go out right as it turned dusk and they would go and just chew and eat the vine and try to eat to the roots of this fruit, of the grapes. And then disrespectfully enough, they would get their fill. They would go take a nap for a second and they'd come back out for more. They'd come back out for more. He said, consistently, they waited until after dusk. The moment there was darkness, they feasted. The moment there was darkness, they feasted. There are so many little foxes that we allow in our vineyards to start to spoil our vineyard. I've seen so many Christians that are on, they, they, they hear the word of God. They've even been in here. They hear the word. They receive the word. They, they come to salvation. They start following Jesus. And then what happens? The little foxes get in. It's not something that, like, I find it hilarious. He talks about little foxes. Little foxes, they say on average, are eight to nine pounds. They're like a little chihuahua. Right? If a chihuahua walked into your wherever, you're not going to be like, like, you can kick that. You could punt that thing. I'm sorry for all the animal friendly loving people, but those things don't, and they, they're just little things. I find it interesting this, that they don't say uh, the elephants, the lions, the tigers, because that would bring attention to our minds. That would bring attention if I saw that. But it's the little foxes, the little things inside my life that I've seen, that I, I, I can just picture people up here. I picture people up here. I can picture different people, that it wasn't the big things. It was just the small little things. And they're no longer following Christ. They're no longer in community. But it's just because the foxes ate a little bit at a time. Folks, if we don't pay attention to the little foxes, if we don't pay attention to those things, they will eat the roots of our vineyard. Little foxes are little things that I overlook. Little foxes are the small things that I excuse or minimize. Little foxes are the little annoyances or irritation in my spirit that I allow. They aren't things that make you tremble when you see them. They aren't, they're just pests. Because there's a reason, there's a reason that they're just little, little foxes. They're just little, little things. They're little annoyances. So what are little foxes in your life? I would suggest some of us, we just start thinking about sin habits. You know what it really is? It's little things. It's uh, things that aren't sin maybe but they chew our vineyard that we abuse. They're little, they're little things that we abuse and they cloud, they cloud our eyes. And I wanna talk about some of those uh, little foxes today. We know the obvious one, right? We know the obvious little fox. We've created more little foxes in our life than ever before. Kids and teenagers, they have more little foxes now the obvious one being social media. It's a little fox. It's just the little fox that just chews up our vineyard at a time. Just chewing up our vineyard. I'm not even saying social media is bad, so don't, don't, don't hear that from me this morning. But some of us, we abuse it so much, it chews up our vineyard. It's chewing the roots. 
What about with that dating apps? Some of you spend so much time trying to find the right one and not working on being the right one. And so you'll spend two, three, four hours swiping left, swiping right, swiping left, swiping right, going on this date, going on this date, going on this date, and not focusing on the things that you can be focused on. It's little foxes that are chewing your vineyard. And now how about this? Here's another one. Some of us lack of sleep. Because we aren't disciplined, we don't discipline ourselves to go to bed at a certain time. It throws off our work ethic. It throws off how we give our effort at our job. It throws off our time with Jesus because we stay up so late. We wake up early. By the time we get food on the table after work for our family and doing this and doing that, we're so tired we just want to numb our minds with something that we can do until we fall asleep. And it's just a little fox that takes you away from Jesus. It's just a little thing. How about not working out? I've found when I don't work out, when I'm not taking care of that discipline, usually it leads to loose ends on everything else. When I'm not disciplined in that area, everything else, I I tend to make justifications for everything else. But if we look at it, it's just a little fox. Ah, I, don't, I don't have to work out. Some of us have gotten so good. We went through the rhythms. And this is by God's good grace that I'm continuing to run. Okay, so I'm not saying I'm a master at this because there are moments where I'm like, I'm lazy. But I see when I am lazy, I usually don't really, I, I, I just spend time with God real quick to be like, check. I just... It leads to other loose ends in my life. How about busyness of the hustle? Some of you are so busy working overtime to live a life that's way over your means. It's way over your means. Can I tell some people in the room? You don't need busyness if you would just budget. (laughs) You wouldn't have to be so busy if you just budget. Just take a moment. And so the busyness of the hustle, you're working 60, 70 hours a week trying to give a life that you, you, that's way over your means that you lack. You, you don't take your kids out. You don't hang out with your kids much. You're not at their, their games. You're not doing things with your kids. You're not with your spouse. You're not, with, you're not loving on people. You're not being able to do ministry at all. You're not able to get into a small group. You're not able to do any of these things because you're too busy. The busyness of the hustle. Some of you, social stimulation. We are so connected with each other that we're forever texting. I'm guilty of this. Sometimes when I'm uh, feeling lazy, to get out of bed to run on a Saturday, I have to call somebody to like stimulate my brain so I can change in my clothes and do these things. But some of you, you talk way more on the phone and text messaging than you've ever talked to God. And an entire year, you can do that on the phone in one day. Some of you, if you, would, if you would fill your spirit like you fill your schedule, man, I got to hit you with the Jonathan. I, I got to hit him with it. If you would fill your spirit the way you felt filled your schedule, come on. What about Entertainment. We love a good Netflix series. We love, you know, the new hottest squid game and all these other things. But here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing, fellas. Don't be surprised if you struggle with lust when you pitch a tent in its camp. Don't be surprised. There's a reason why you're still addicted. There's a reason why you still look at every female. You pitch a tent in its camp. Duh. You know, one of the best things that we've done in our staff is uh, after a few uh, people fell from church, Pastor Jonathan took a stand and he was like, no more. We won't be that church. We're all accountable to each other. So whatever goes on my phone goes into Jonathan's email, which is 
which is weird and uncomfortable, but vice versa. Everything that Jonathan sees, he got flagged the other day for looking up Puma sneakers. I was like, Jonathan, control your eyes, buddy. You know, like looking up Adidas, he was flagged for it. And I, you know, we send random things, but why? Fellas, you're pitching a tent in the enemy's camp. Don't be surprised. Ladies, you know why you struggle, why, why you struggle with feeling less than? You don't feel beautiful? All the models you follow on Instagram. You pitched a tent in the enemy's camp. No wonder you're still comparing yourself to everybody. You've pitched a tent there. How about this? Junk food. Some of you live your life so busy. You're so busy. You live on junk food. You live on fast food. You live on, on crap that actually doesn't, because you're too busy. You're not taking care. Showing discipline in those areas, so you're feasting on junk food. Did you know if you're constantly eating junk food, it causes chemical imbalances. It can cause depression, memory loss. Your hormones are th uh, thrown off. There's so many things when you live. I'm not saying, what I'm not saying is don't eat junk food, okay? Because I had some junk food last night that was fabulous. But some of us are living our lives on junk food. What about this? Relationships that are good, but aren't godly. You can have a good relationship where the fella treats you right or the lady treats you right, but it ain't godly. It ain't God's best. I've seen relationships throw us off so much in the eyes of our heart and it gets cloudy because we're looking for good and not godly. And we're settling for that, man. You know, I think a lot of us, we could cut down on a lot of anxiety and depression in our country. You know, we lead the way in that. I, I want you to know. We lead the way in America in depression and anxiety. And a lot of it could be cut down if we would take care of the things that we know lead to that. We would take care of it. Not all of it, but we'd take care of a lot of it. So look, you got to look in the areas that don't seem bad. Why? Because my consumption could lead to my confusion and my own condemnation. My consumption could lead to my own. Why is God not moving in my life? Why are these things happening? Well, what are you consuming? What are you feasting on? What's consuming your time? And then leads to my own condemnation because, oh my gosh, I'm just, God doesn't love me and God doesn't care and I just don't feel him. And I, no, look what you are consuming. It leads to your confusion, which is your own condemnation that you feel, which, which then still eats at your vineyards. It eats at your vineyards. The little foxes in my life that I'm not looking at as the root problem are leading to why you feel off. We have to watch out for the little foxes. We must watch out for them. Number one, we watch out for the Sam's Club samples. Number two, we watch out for false labeling. Much like the food industry, they will tell you whatever whenever to get you to buy their product. They'll say, sugar-free. No, they just changed the name. That's all they did. Fat-free. I've eaten some of those fat-free things. They didn't cause that. They, they weren't fat-free. But they'll sell you, they'll label whatever it is to get you to buy that product and feel a little better about yourself. Luke eleven thirty five 35 says this. It says, make sure the light that you think you have is not actually darkness. Make sure the light that you think you have. Now, I was thinking, what could Jesus possibly be talking about? How could you think you had light? I've never turned on a light and was like, is this light? You know what I'm saying? 
It doesn't even compute in my brain. What is interesting in the very next part, as I was reading the very next chapter, or the very next part of Luke 11, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And if you're new to church, the Pharisees were the knowledge having, the rule following, the backbreakers. They could tell you everything wrong with your faith. They could tell you everything wrong that you were doing. And so Jesus, he goes in to have dinner with these Pharisees. And he sits down to have a meal without doing the hand washing ceremony that was required by law. And Jesus switches up the whole dinner. Have you ever had a dinner where you know you're gonna bring up something and you're like, I'm gonna wait till the end because I'm not gonna make this whole thing awkward. Jesus literally made the, uh, the most awkward dinner ever. He switches the whole thing up. Like everybody's sitting there like, okay. But Jesus starts the dinner off and he reads their mind and he says, you know what? You guys clean the outside of your cups. You know how to do that really well. But didn't I make the outside and the inside? He goes on to call them fools. Now, I don't know about you, but it would hurt my heart if Jesus looked dead in my soul and said, I'm a fool. Like Jesus said, you guys are fools because you come and you bring the outside. You clean the outside of the glass, but you don't clean the inside. Sometimes we think we're so full of light, but the truth of the matter is we've only cleaned the outside of the dish. Oh, we can tell people we're the light of the world. We, we hand out tracts. You know, I know those are old school now, but people still are on the street preaching. Like you do all of these things. You talk about the externals, who you are in Christ. I'm a new creation. Did you know that? but we never clean the inside. See, it is possible. You can come to church. You could be in a small group. You could come to worship. You can do everything. You could do everything that's really, really religious and still not be filled with light. The inside, it's not taking place inside. I'll give you an example. How about Judas? Judas. Judas was known as a disciple, guys. I mean, we know the end of the story, but the dude literally was a part of the 12. He was with the greatest preacher of all time, did the best ministry of all time. I mean, he saw healings. He saw deliverances. I bet he was a part of those, but he never let what was happening externally affect him internally. See, you can be a part of this church, but until you declare that the Lord and surrender parts of your heart to Christ, it's only affecting externally. It's only affecting externally. And if we aren't careful we can lead the same life as Judas, where the outside seems healthy, but actually we're filled with darkness. Friends, let me tell you this. It is totally possible to be religious without righteous. It's totally possible to be religious without being righteous. And that's why every day, what do we have to do? We have to search. This is, uh, this is ironic, but it, we have to search for blind spots. We have to ask Jesus, but we, sometimes we don't even have to, we, we need to ask Jesus, but we need to ask the people around us who know us. Where are they? Where are my blind spots? See, Psalms 1828 says this, for you light my lamp. The Lord my God illuminates my darkness. And Psalms 36, nine in the Passion Translation says, the fountain of life froze, flows from you to satisfy me. In your light of holiness, we receive the light of revelation. In the light of holiness and the light of him, we receive revelation. He exposes those things. So my heart, my life, my eyes can be filled 
with life. We have to watch out for blind spots. We have to make sure the Holy Spirit is still shining on the things that are going on inside of my life. And the third thing I want to talk about today, and I want to end with that, is really we need to watch for, but watch out to make a healthy plan. Watch out to make a healthy plan. You know what brings peace to chaos? Well, we have a plan. It brings so much peace to our chaos. We don't fight the enemy by saying like, okay, God, I'll do better. Like no sports team has ever gone in and been like, they ask dumb questions at the end in interviews like, uh, what'd you do to win this game? And they're like, you know what we did? We just, we just talked to each other. We said, we really want to win this game. And we came out and we did it. So that's why we're champions today. No. You know what they do in baseball? They're looking for what you pitch. They're looking for how you like the strike zone and how you like. They're examining every single strategy that you have that they can counteract and win that. In football, they're looking at the defenses you really like, the packages you like to line up with. In basketball, they're looking at your offense. You like to pick and roll. In defense, you like the 2-3 zone. What do you do? They study you. If we don't make a healthy plan, we always will lose. I'm not, what, what I think is, is sometimes right now, the Holy Spirit's speaking things to your life that are the little things, but if all he does is speak them to you and all you do is you have a good intention and you bring attention, you just did the first step. He's still gonna chew your vineyards. The little foxes in my life, the little things in my life, if you don't make a strategy against them. You know, some of you, you need to go and set a time limit on what you consume on social media. Because they do do that. I don't know for Android users, but I know for iPhoneers, you can set a time limit. You can set something. That's a strategy. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm reading a book on digital minimalism. And like every time I read it, I'm like, I want to throw my phone as far as I can. Because I'm still, I, 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 I'm making a strategy to win this thing. Friends, he's going to keep chewing the vines. And what I'm sick of seeing, I'm sick of seeing the small things become these big things that lead, like, that just eventually chew our vineyards. They chew them up. You know, sometimes we blame God for not speaking or moving, but I've found more often Jesus is stuck in the traffic jam of trash in my life. Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always wanna take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> we want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.